Um, good morning. I'm Amanda Glassman. I'm a senior fellow here at the Center for Global Development. And I'm pleased to welcome you to today's discussion on the behavioral economics of extreme poverty. This event is the third in an ongoing series that's organized by the US Agency for International Development to talk about President Obama's commitment to eradicate extreme poverty within a generation. And we're so pleased to collaborate with USAID in hosting Sendhil Malanathan, who is professor of economics at Harvard University, the author of Scarcity, Why Having Too Little Means So Much, and he's also a non-resident fellow here at the Center for Global Development. Sendhil studies behavioral economics and its applications to social problems and most notably poverty from our perspective. Um, his work runs a huge gamut from the impact of poverty on mental bandwidth, which we'll talk about today, whether CEO pay is excessive, showing that higher cigarette taxes make smokers happier, which is one of my favorites, um, and the idea that scarcity makes it harder for the poor to make good decisions about their own health, nutrition, investments, and other issues. So he'll, his remarks, he'll talk for about 15, 20 minutes. Then we'll follow with a panel discussion um, made up of Salgado Dada, who's the vice president at Ideas 42, which takes some of these ideas and tries to translate them into practice, with Ariel Pablos Mendez, who's the assistant administrator at the Bureau of Global Health at USAID, and with Norbert Shady, who's the principal economic advisor for the social sector at the Inter-American Development Bank and has worked a lot on these issues himself. So please uh, join me in welcoming Sandal Milanathan. Come to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk in my comments just about by thinking about poverty. What is, what is poverty? Oh, my mic is on now. That's good. Oh, now you can hear what I'm saying. Um, let me start thinking about what is poverty. I think that in a funny way, poverty is uh, fairly trivial to understand. It's a uh, lack of money. And what more is there? Uh, you have a problem. You don't have money. You need a problem to fix. What I want to tell you that is that that's not, exactly, uh, that's not exactly right, or that we're missing something important. And that, was, that missing is sort of the core of the book with Eldar, that when we experience poverty, we're short on money, that's true, but that being short on money has a bunch of psychological consequences. And in fact, whenever we're short on something, whether we're short on time because we're busy, short on calories because we're dieting, that these same psychological consequences come. And in fact, that this is what I want to argue the lens by which we can understand a whole set of behaviors, and that we can understand it through understanding uh, Scarcity. So I just tell you a funny story. Uh, when we started working on this, I was telling a colleague of mine that, oh, look, we're working on this science of scarcity, this new science of scarcity, because new is a good word you want to help. This colleague of mine said to me, oh, that's kind of funny. There's already a science of scarcity. You might have heard of it. It's called the economics. And um, I, I might know something about economics, which got me wondering, well, what is the difference between economics and what I'm going to tell you today? So maybe the difference can be brought to mind uh, with this beautiful image. These are the kind of drinks I like to drink. Uh, I've only had one before, because it's early in the morning, so things are good. Picture yourself going to a dinner with a friend, and um, imagine that before dinner, the waiter or waitress comes to you and says, we have this cocktail on the menu. Are you interested? You hear it. Sounds pretty good. And you're like, all right, uh, maybe, maybe I will buy this cocktail. What are all the things that go through your mind in deciding whether to buy this cocktail? You might say, is my friend drinking? You might say, am I driving home? You might say, what's the price? It's New York, so $15. That seems reasonable. Uh, and these are all the thoughts that might come to mind. There's a thought that doesn't come to mind, actually. It's kind of interesting that this thought doesn't come to mind for most of you in the audience, maybe for all of you in the audience. So what is this thing? It's like the dog that didn't bark. 
in the Sherlock Holmes story. Well, <clears throat> to understand what you didn't think of that you maybe ought to have thought of, or not ought to, but that some people think of, imagine you're on a diet. Same story, exact same thing. Now what's something that'll occur to you? You'll say, oh, if I have this cocktail, it's going to cost me 250 calories. What will I not have to make up for those 250 calories? But you know, this cocktail also costs you money. Almost none of you thought to yourself, if I spend these $15, what will I not spend instead? It's almost a ridiculous question when you have enough money. What do you mean, what will I not spend? I have a lot of money in the savings account. I'll buy a lot of stuff. But that's the fundamental difference between the economics of scarcity and the psychology of scarcity. Because I hate to break it to you, you may have a lot of money in the bank account, but it is still finite. If you buy this $15 cocktail, there is $15 less of stuff that you will buy. But that doesn't come to mind. But just like the dieter immediately understands the trade-off, the poor person actually, in questions such as this, immediately says, oh, if I buy this, what will I not buy? And to me, that's the fundamental difference. The difference between the scarcity I'm going to present to you today and the economics of scarcity is that economics tells us scarcity is everywhere. Scarcity is ubiquitous. If we build a bridge, we don't have money for this. Whenever we use the resource, time, money, whatever, we have less elsewhere. The psychology of scarcity is not that. The psychology of scarcity is remarkably not ubiquitous. We have finite money, but when you're well off, $10, $20 purchases feel infinite. It feels like you can make any number of them, you actually experience the psychology of abundance. At other times, when you're very busy, you suddenly feel the scarcity of time. So my undergraduates at the beginning of the semester have the psychology of abundance with time, and at the end of the semester they have the psychology of scarcity with time, even though it's still 24-7. Okay, so I just want to put that in the mind. Now I'm going to give you a test. Um, you guys ready for this? It's exciting. Get a pen and paper out, and here's what we're going to do. Don't Cheat, because I have to tell that all the time because I teach Harvard undergrads. Um, <laughs> so you guys, well, I mean, I'm in Washington, so maybe I have to use the same thing here. Moving along, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to read a list of words, OK? Don't write anything down while I'm reading. Listen to me. Then at the end, I want you to write down all the words that I said that you remembered. Does that seem reasonable? Does that make sense to you guys? OK. Here we go. All right, here's my list of words. I'm going to make sure I have it all ready, just so that I can. Ready? OK, don't write now. Write at the end. OK, here we go. Woman, husband, uncle, lady, father, strong, beard, person, son, handsome, muscle, male. OK, write down everything you remember. People look mostly done. A little bit like the restroom. If you haven't gotten it by now, it's nothing's coming out. All right, so let's move right along. So um, how many people remember the word uh, woman? We're on the list. That's pretty good. That's called the primacy effect. That's the first word I said. How many people remember the word uh, muscle? That's pretty, that was like one of the last words I said. Let's go somewhere in the middle. Beard? Pretty good, yeah. Strong? Man? That's pretty good, yeah. So here's the word man in the list like this. So here we did this with high income and low income people. And you see, you guys did slightly better than average. Maybe you're awake, you just had some coffee. <laughs> Maybe you're lying. Um, and you'll see people remember the word man at about 18%. You know. And here's a funny thing about this word man. Um, this was a list of words. And oddly enough, the word man is not on that list. <laughs> so excellent job on remembering the word man. Quite impressive, really. Now, of course, none of you remember the word rutabaga. Or did you? Did anyone write down rutabaga? That would be impressive if you did. Um, 
And why did you remember the word man? Well, this, is, this is a classic psychological test. It's a way of inducing a false memory. There are many such word lists. See, this word list kind of feels like the word man could be there. It's implied by words that are there, right? Beard, strong. Even if you delete things like male, which is close, it's just there, like handsome, son, I mean, whatever. It's close, uncle. Now, the poor and the rich both showed the same false memory effect. Let me give you another list. The same experiment with this list. Rent, grocery, gas, utilities, blah, blah, blah. And now, let's look at the frequency of remembering the word money. Now, money is not on this list. It could be implied by the words on this list. I mean, it's sort of related to dollar for all of us, dollar and cash. But when you think phone, you're well enough off that you're not thinking money. Even when you think bill, you're probably thinking, when is it due? Not how much is it? Not so for the poor. They see those words, and they feel they heard the word money. Because for them, what's top of mind? When they hear a bill, when they hear a oh, car, you look at a car, and you say, oh, that's a Ford Fiesta. Is that a real car? Let's assume it's a real car. You, you think, oh, that's a Ford Fiesta. But in fact, they look at a car and they say, oh my god, I have my insurance payment due. This is the essence of the psychology of scarcity, that all of these things that are top of mind when you are short on money, and that being poor doesn't just mean not having money. It means constantly having thoughts about the stuff that's coming due, about the stuff that you need to make payments on, all of those things constantly top of mind. Think of what a graph like this shows us. It, it shows us that the fundamental cognitive structure of your mind has now changed because you're poor. Not in a way that's like permanent, but in a way that changes how you think. So let me show you the consequence of this, and that's what I'm going to talk about mainly. To show you the consequences, I'm going to show you a fun experiment. So the experiment is, I suppose you, before you present your own experiment, you can't say it's fun. So I'm going to show you an experiment. Here's the experiment. It's a word search. So we had people look for words like, you know, find the word street. And then once they found the word street, and you're not going to listen to anything I say until I show you where the word, this is where the word street is. <laughs> so there you go. Exciting. After they find the word street, the, the puzzle clears. A new puzzle shows up. And then they have to find the next word, tree. And new puzzle, picture, cloud, and they know the words that are coming. So what did we do? Half the subjects did this. But for the other half, we replaced the word street with the word cake. We replaced the word picture with the word donut. You can see where this is going. It's a sort of very tasty ex exercise. So we replaced half the words. Why do we do this? Well, everybody searched for the word tree or cloud or lamp or rain. But some people, before they search for cloud, they search for picture. And other people, before they search for the word cloud, they search for a donut. So we were interested, how quickly did you find the cloud if you just look for a picture or if you just look for donut? It turns out that in this pool, for a bunch of our subjects, 60%, I think, didn't make a difference. They were just as quick to find the cloud if they just looked for a picture or looked for a donut. After all, why should it make a difference? But for a fraction of them, it made a difference. Can you guess which fraction? Close. Dieters. So here's the non-dieters, small difference. Here's the dieters. They're much slower to find the cloud if they just searched for the donut. It's like their mind was still on the donut, right? They were like, oh, yeah, donut. Now, keep in mind, this is not even a real donut. It's the words D-O-N-U-T. But that's the essence of what it means to not have something. There's a part of your brain that keeps saying, hey, we need this thing. It self-generates this. It keeps calling your mind. Now, there's a funny consequence in this study. It means that the dieters do worse. They do worse because they should be looking for the cloud, but they're thinking about the donut. So in this study, they just earn less money because, well, they're mentally preoccupied. So let's just play that forward. What could that mean? Well, 
if you're poor, there now is a fundamentally different link between poverty and behavior. When you're poor, I want to introduce a term, what's called as bandwidth. Bandwidth is your mental functioning, your mental capacity. The, the sort of the mental, uh, I used to call it the mind's eye, but Anud Shah, who I work with, said that is the most awful expression I've ever heard. So I think it's not a bad expression. I'm Indian. I can pull off phrases like mind's eye, but whatever. So we won't use that. The, the sort of the mental spotlight, your ability to focus on things, your ability to think clearly about things, that is what I mean by bandwidth. Now, bandwidth is a construct. It's a construct that captures many psychological things. And I'm not going to get too deep into it, but I'll give you some consequences. When you're low on bandwidth, you're not thinking as clearly. When you're low on bandwidth, you lack self-control. You aren't able to learn things. You don't remember things. You're less creative. We could go on. But the basic notion is there is a mental capacity we have. It's called that bandwidth. And what a little bit the glimmer you're seeing is that the person who should be searching for the cloud, their bandwidth, which would be used to search for the cloud, is over here on the donut. So for the dieters, it leads to an amusing consequence. The dieters earn less in the study because they have less bandwidth to give to this problem. There's a slightly less amusing consequence for the poor. Because after all, if the dieter can be taxed with bandwidth by a donut, the poor could be taxed on bandwidth by the very circumstances of their poverty. So how do we test this? How do we test a hypothesis like this? And this is a sense to wrap back to what I was saying earlier. This is a sense in which now we're talking about the psychology of scarcity. This is not about there are trade-offs. You buy one thing, you don't. This is about when you're poor, I'm now going to argue to you, this is the thing you lack. So how would I test that? So the way I'm going to test that is first, let me just give you some fairly mechanical stuff. What does it mean when I say bandwidth? I'm going to measure two things. These are two measures that are pretty well tested, you know, 50 years of psychometric, more than 50 years of psychometrics. The first is called executive function, and the second is fluid intelligence. I'll just give you what these tests are so you have a sense of it. Executive function, you can test in many ways. One of them is called the cognitive control task. You say to people, when you see the heart, it's going to appear on the screen on either side, hit the side that the heart is on. But when you see the flower, hit the opposite side. It's a pretty trivial task, but it's a pretty trivial task to screw up, too, because you're like, heart, 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 fl oh, wait, no, the other side. And when you're alert, when you have a lot of bandwidth, you do well at this task. When you're tired, when you're thinking about that fight you had with your spouse, you do badly at this task. This is a measure of impulse control, executive function, our capacity to control our impulses. This is Raven's progressive matrices. This is an IQ test. These are fairly too culturally, whatever. Basically, the question is, what goes in this square, or whatever that is. Does that make sense to everybody? Again, the answer is, I don't know what the answer is. You'll figure it out. Think about it. I, I always get this wrong. <laughs> whatever. It's one of them. I, I promise you it's one of them. So what do we do? So I'm going to give these tests. But first, I'm going to give these tests in a New Jersey. This is a New Jersey mall. Uh, if none of you have had a chance to go, you should go. It's one of the, the great American uh, sites. It's a natural museum, I think. So this is a New Jersey mall. We went there, and what we needed to do was we needed to give this IQ test now, and these two tests. I'm not that interested in just comparing poor and rich because so many things are different. The people who are in this mall who are poor may be different than people who are in this mall who are rich. But I want to redo this study. I want to redo what we did with the dieters. Remember with the dieters, we just like put like the words D-O-N-U-T in front of them, and all of a sudden we saw them do badly? So now I want to replace the cake with money. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to go to the people in this mall. I'm going to give half of them this test. That's like the condition where you don't see the donut. And to the other half, I'm going to make them ever so slightly think about money. I'm going to give them a question. Hey, if, you, uh, if John had his car break down, what would he do? What are some options he has for paying for that? I'm not even asking you about a problem you have. I'm just, it's like the word D-O-N-U-T. Does that make sense to everybody? OK, so what happens? This is the poor and the rich when we don't tickle them uh, on IQ. There's a little bit of a difference, hard to see with the stretched out graph, but not such a big difference in how well they do on ravens. Tickle them a little bit, and all of a sudden, their intelligence, nothing happens to the rich. For the poor, their intelligence drops dramatically. And as you can see this here, this is the accuracy of the number of ravens items. You All we had to do was, and I'll come back to how dramatic this is, but do the same thing with the, the executive control task. 
Now there's more of a difference between rich and poor, but make the poor make everybody think a little bit about money. Not much happens to the rich. The poor suddenly boom. And this is a huge gap. Let me tell you another study, just so you see. We, now, I wanted to do a, a different study where we don't tickle anybody. Um, so we went to sugarcane farmers in India. And these farmers get paid once a year. Terrible idea. I always remember when I was a grad student, Harvard uh, had this foolish policy of paying their PhD students once a semester. So you got your entire stipend. So January was like a really tough month because it was like needed. And these farmers are like me. The month before harvest is a very tough month. All the past things have run out. The month after harvest is a good month because now you just had a lot of cash. But what does that mean? That means we get the same person when they're poor and when they're rich. So we don't even need to tickle anybody. We can actually just go and measure bandwidth when the people are poor and when people are rich. That's what we do. And what do you find? The same person pre-harvest, significantly dumber on IQ, significantly less impulse control. They're much slower in responding to this task and makes much more errors. Now, I keep telling you significantly. That's just me trying to bully you into thinking this is a big effect. So let me actually tell you uh, the sense in which it, whether it's a big effect or not. So psychology is a fun field mainly because I think as far as I can tell, you can torture people. So one form of torture is that sleep psychologists bring people into the lab. And what they say is, to half the people, to you guys, here's a really nice, quiet, climate-controlled room. Just sit and sleep, and you know it's going to be a really good, good night for you. You guys, no sleep for you. And I have a PhD student who's going to sit next to you, and if they even see you closing your eyes, they're going to shake you awake. What has just happened? Oh my god. So now we have two people. One, you guys, just pulled an all-nighter. 9 AM has come. You haven't even closed your eyes. You guys, well-rested. And then we give you IQ tests on both sides. Just introspect a minute. What is it like after you pulled an all-nighter? You all remember being an undergrad. You all remember that paper that you wrote at 4 AM that felt just so good. <laughs> and then you went back and you looked. This is probably the only thing we learn in college, that the papers you write at 4 AM are nowhere as good as they seemed at 4 AM. You're an idiot after an all-nighter. So people find huge effects of this. It's a big surprise. The effects we find in poverty are about three quarters of this effect. The poor every day have just pulled an all-nighter. So these are not small effects. These are enormous effects on bandwidth. In fact, I would go back and say, well, I think we're thinking about poverty quite incompletely. That being poor doesn't mean lacking money. Being poor fundamentally also means lacking bandwidth. And if I think of this from a policy point of view, I would say that's probably the biggest policy mistake we're making. Think of what it means in economics. The worst mistake you can make in any policy is to treat a resource as free when it's not. Well, guess what we treat as free all the time? Bandwidth. Getting somebody to think about something, getting somebody to follow through on something, getting somebody to do self-control, process, listen to you, listen to your educational campaign on HIV, getting people to show up at your meeting, getting people to follow the conditionalities of a cash transfer. Each of these things uses a resource, a resource which is bandwidth, a resource which is scarce for the very population that you're targeting. You would never charge the poor a huge fee because you would immediately say that's regressive. But yet you charge the poor in bandwidth all the time. That's a regressive policy as well. Are we economizing on bandwidth? Are we thinking about the fact that this policy is using this bandwidth? When we do a conditional cash transfer and we're saying, hey, let's now put down 80 conditions, do we say each of these conditions for someone to follow is mentally costly? And is condition 68 worth it? It's just not the logic we take. We just throw it in. We say, oh, look, there was a treatment effect. Yes, there was a treatment effect, but it used a resource that then had other consequences the rest of life. It's not free. So that's the first policy lesson, which is that bandwidth taxes are regressive. We don't even recognize this as policymakers. The second lesson I'm going to tell you comes from a story, uh, a World War II story. This is the B-17. Um, this is a flying fortress. It's a very nice plane, lots of leg room. And in World War II, something was happening with the B-17s. People were, pilots, were landing these planes. And they would come, they would land, and just as they hit the runway, they retracted the landing gear. And not to get too technical, but that's a terrible idea. Because the plane would just go crying in the ground. They lost the plane. Sometimes they lost the pilot. 
usually pilots survived. Bad idea. So they wanted to understand what was going wrong with the training of these pilots, as people said at the time, excellent airmen commit no errors, and this is the mother of all errors. So they brought in this guy, Lieutenant Chapanis. Lieutenant Chapanis was a psychologist, and they said to him, we want you to look into the pilots' heads. We want you to figure out what's going on in the psychology of these pilots. What, are we not training them? Are they not remembering their training? What the hell is going on? I assume they used words like hell back then. I don't know. This might not be historically accurate. Um, and Chapinus did something very funny, something you all should be grateful for. Chapinus did something that then led to innovations in um, avi uh, aviation that are probably responsible about for 90% of the reduction in air traffic, uh, air, um, airplane fatalities in the last 70 years. You're much safer on a plane now than you were in 1950, and it's due to what Chapinus did next. What did he do? So he started by looking in people's heads, and he said, screw this. Again, not necessarily historically accurate. I don't know if he said screw this. He said, I'm going to look inside the cockpit. That's not exactly the B-17 cockpit, but inside the B-17 cockpit, there were two levers, like this. One was the way you retract the landing gear. Right next to it, shaped exactly the same, was the thing for lowering the flaps. Now, when you land, you should lower the flaps so that you slow down the plane. And Chapin said, of course this is going to happen. Because after all, you put two things next to each other that are the same, mistakes will happen. This is a huge insight in aviation. You cannot imagine. It's called human factors design. It's a fundamental insight that no matter how well you train the pilot, no matter how well you incentivize the pilot, think about that. No pilot is better incentivized than any person in any policy you're ever going to write. They're not sitting up there and saying, oh, what the hell? I don't have the incentives. Nah, screw this. <laughs> That's not what's happening. This person is perfectly incentivized. Yet what happens? Mistakes happen. That the point of engineering is not just to build planes that are you know, really good at dealing with turbulence, that the point of engineering is also to deal with the faults, the turbulence of the human mind that led to the fault tolerant engineering. You need to make sure that you minimize the chance of error. That's how you design a cockpit. You need to make sure that when there is an error, there's lots of alarms that go off. You need to make sure that when there's an error and it continues, that the consequences of that error are not fatal. These three principles have really transformed the cockpit. Here's the question I have for you. If we can put so much energy into creating fault-tolerant cockpits, why don't we have fault-tolerant policy? Fault tolerance is not even a notion we have. Once you realize that bandwidth is limited, you realize mistakes will happen. Mistakes are not about incentives. They're not people saying, oh, well, I'm going to game the system. They're just mistakes. They're just, I want to do this, and this is going to happen. What's so funny about mistakes is, in policy conversations, you're like, oh, well, mistakes. In your own life, I mean, forget you. I don't want to judge you. In my own life, I can look back yesterday and say I made 10 mistakes, one of which was a big mistake. It's a mistake. No amount of incentives is going to deal with that. It's an email that you shouldn't have sent. It's a thing you shouldn't have said to your spouse. It's mistakes. Why are we not thinking about fault tolerance? Why are we not thinking about policy that recognizes people make mistakes? Why does this matter for poverty? Mistakes are a consequence of limited bandwidth, and the poor are in the position to make the most mistakes. Finally, I'm going to end on a positive note. The positive note I'm going to end is that once you realize bandwidth is a resource, well, some programs might actually be game changers in the sense that if I said to you, I have this savings product, and um, by the way, I think this savings product is going to raise IQ, you would have said, you're an idiot. I mean, you may still say I'm an idiot. But after what I've done today, I hope you can see that could happen. A farmer who doesn't have this cycle, forget the farmer. Harvard, when it switched to giving their graduate students stipends every month, might have increased the quality of their output. Because now you don't have graduate students in January worrying about making rent payment, but actually doing their freaking work. A savings product that smoothed the payments out might make better parents. Why? Because pre-harvest, you don't have all this bandwidth constraint. Now parents are actually being better parents. It helps every program. Bandwidth is a core resource. It's an infrastructure on which every program rides. And programs that go and help build bandwidth by getting rid of this volatility, by getting rid of these micro shocks of scarcity that preoccupy the mind, can actually change things a lot. 
And to me, this is perhaps what I'll end, is probably the doorway to think about extreme poverty. And when we think about extreme poverty, we shouldn't just think about the lack of money. And we shouldn't just think about programs to address that lack of money. We should understand that being poor, being extremely poor, means having very little mind, because most of your mind is just being occupied. And that what we ought to be thinking about is how do we free up all of these mental resources of these hundreds of millions of people and essentially create bandwidth. OK, let me stop. Thank you. Thank you for making us all think about men, not males. But, um, <laughs> we wanted to ask our panelists to reflect a little bit on what the implication of these findings are for the work at their own institutions, and if they can name some ways that they've taken some of these ideas into account in policy and programs, and then you know ask you to jump in whenever you have something to say. So maybe, can we start with Norbert? Sure. Um, and Norbert might show one graphic, yeah, show and one. maybe you'll just raise your hand when you're ready to show. Uh, you picture. might as well. Okay. You can put it up now. Put it up now. Go ahead. So, I I found the the presentation uh, very interesting. I also read the book, uh, most of it. Um, I had limited bandwidth, I must admit, because I was watching Breaking Bad at the same time. So oh. maybe I got That's it. tough competition. It is tough competition. But, I also you know. cook crystal. Oh my! Yeah, I yeah. said that. No, I know. Oh my I God! Know. Can you edit that out? Uh, yeah. So. Um, and it, obviously, it's, the insights from behavioral economics are something that has been become very um, important in sort of policy discussions, uh, both in, in, in developing and developed countries. And I wanted to sort of reflect a little bit on a number of things, how this translates into policy. And I wanted to make reference, it's hard to see this, this graph. This is one of the first points I wanted to make. Sendel mentioned that the concept of bandwidth and the choices you make are fundamentally related to these things that are often grouped under a concept called executive function. Right? An executive function, as Sendler was mentioning, is the capacity control, to control um, sort of instinctive responses, the capacity to reflect, slow down, and reflect on things. It has various components, like what's called working memory, the capacity for attention, cognitive flexibility, things like that. And this graph here is from work that colleagues and I have been doing on Ecuador, which is on five-year-old children. These five-year-old children, we have a sample of actually about 16,000 five-year-old children to whom we applied 12 different tests. Four math tests, these are beginning kindergarten. Four math tests, four language tests, and four executive function tests. They're the kind of tests that Sendel was mentioning. They're actually really cool, and I'll just spend one minute describing a couple of them. For example, one test is almost exactly the kind of thing that Sendel was showing, which is you show kids a picture of a moon, and you say, when you see the picture of the moon, say day, and when you see the picture of the sun, say night. And these go by quite quickly. Right? Um, another one of the tests is one that's called a test of cognitive flexibility. That one's actually pretty cool as well. What you have is you have a set of cards and two boxes. The cards have either trucks or apples, and, the a and both are either red or blue. And you tell the kid, look, first we're going to play the game that involves colors. And in the game of colors, I want you to put all the red cards over here and all the blue cards over there. And so you give the kid a card, say, this is a red card, where does it go? This is a blue card, where does it go? And the kid does you know, whatever they think. Then about after 10 iterations of this, you say, now we're going to play the game of shapes, no longer the game of colors. In the game of shapes, I want you to put all the trucks over here and all the apples over here, no matter what their color. And as you hand over the card, you say to them, this is a truck, this is an apple, this is a truck, this is an apple. About 30% of the kids keep on doing what they were doing before. They put the red cards with the red cards and the blue cards with the blue cards. Even if after every third mistake you stop them and you say, remember, we're now playing the game of shapes. In the game of shapes, the trucks go over here and the apples go over there. Let's continue. This is a truck. And they keep on putting it with a color. Now, the point of this graph here is that at, five year, at age five years, the differences between the children of parents who have more or less education are already huge in this. And they're not accounted for by differences in nutritional status, because what we control, we have data, for example, on hemoglobin, 
heights, that we know whether these kids have eaten in the morning. It's not about that. These kids already at age five have huge differences in exactly the kinds of things that Sendel was talking about, which in some sense raises the policy question. This is a huge challenge because it's not just about adults who are making these mistakes. Oh, if we just smooth this credit, you know, um, this way or that way, then we're going to get rid of the problem. It's already happening very early in childhood. You could say maybe the kids, and, and it can't, I, I doubt it's because of the kids' limited bandwidth, right? So it's either something hereditary, you know, that adults, have, these adults have less bandwidth in some way, and that's communicate or less self-control or whatever, or it's something about the home environment, which itself is affected by the limited bandwidth. But in any event, the problem is a lot more complicated, at least in this case, than you know, at first glance one might want to think. Because these are the same kids. We follow them over time. And these are the same kids that then continue on doing worse on these kinds of tests as well as other tests. You know, as they age, we have panel data for over 12 years now in which we follow these same kids. And the kids who do badly at this do badly in all kinds of other things later on as well. So the first point is just the complexity of it. Um, the second point that I wanted to make is um, a little bit on the, on the policy implications. And I wanted to say two things. Um, the first is that, that photograph that Sendel put up there of the book on CCTs, that was a book that I wrote on CCTs with some colleagues, so I feel I have to respond a little bit to that, because I feel like Sendel set up a little bit of a straw man with his 80 conditions. Most CCTs, have, most CCTs now have one condition, school attendance. Um, so there, it's hard to see how that would really tax um, bandwidth. You've got one condition. You get the cash if your child is attending school regularly. Nevertheless, I think it does raise an important question, maybe not the question that Sendel raised, but, but one that I want to raise which very often these kinds of findings translate, this is not something that Sendel stressed in the presentation, but does come up in the book and in other books about behavioral economics. Well, these people have limited bandwidth, so they're making these crummy choices. So, you know, let's, let's somehow facilitate the choices for them. Let's nudge them into making better choices, right? And that's not something Sendel mentioned here, but that does come up a lot in this literature. And so the question is, when you nudge people, this is what soft paternalism, right? That's what's often the discussion. So that it really hinges on you, the policymaker, having a good idea of what is, these people are, you know, they're trapped in this limited bandwidth world, they've got these tunnel vision, so I'm gonna set up these default options or I'm gonna nudge them to do certain things that they wouldn't do otherwise, that'll help sort of get them out of this poverty trap where they're doing these crummy decisions that are affecting their long-term well-being. It really means that you have to get the nudges, first you have to get the nudge right that actually works. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fine. But the more important question is the nudge had better be incentivizing, they're, I mean, an alternative explanation is the poor are actually making rational decisions. And what we're doing, we're coming in and we're saying, you guys are making not very rational decisions. I'm going to nudge you or I'm going to compel you to do something instead of what you're doing. So let me go back to the example of CCTs. The example of CCTs is kind of, in some sense, what you're saying is, look, we're only going to give you this cash transfer if you do a certain behavior. We're going to incentivize that particular behavior, right? You can think of it as slightly less soft paternalism than a nudge, right? I mean, they can still say, we don't want the money, right? And it's not, as I said, it's not really an issue of bandwidth in the sense that you're saying, look, here's this one thing you have to do. So we all decided in our infinite wisdom that what we have to do is get kids into school. And that's probably overall, most people, if I asked, you know, do you think it's a good idea to get the poor people into school? You say, oh, of course, yeah, this is really important to get the poor pe people into school. Well, now what we find, for example, it's this is not something that, you know, I, I don't want to overstress this. This is mainly to make the, 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 the point about nudging and sort of how much the social planner knows and how much the individual who's making these decisions knows is that all of these kids that we incentivize to go to school, go to school, they want the money, they go to school but they learn virtually nothing in school. There's a paper that I'm uh, with a colleague, Dion Filmer, that we now have coming out in the Journal of Human Resources, which shows, yes, the program worked, it got everybody into school, but these people who got to school, this is from a program in Cambodia, learned nothing as a result of it. They do no better. We incentivize them all to go into school. What was the point of incentivizing them all to go to school? We thought it was because they were, you know, they were, they, they were trapped in this. No, perhaps they were making rational choices. These people didn't go to school because either the schools were so bad that they didn't want to go to school or because they had the characteristics and they knew it that made them very unlikely to get something out of the kind of education that was being provided. So all this business of, you know, they don't know, we know better, we're going to set the system up to make, really hinges on this belief that we know better than they do what it is that they should be doing. The third point, and that, with that I end, is that I wanted to make is, I mean, now, this is a little bit, maybe this is a little bit unfair because Sendil didn't claim if we really took these principles into account, we would 
somehow eradicate poverty or it would be easy. But I mean, I think a little bit about the kinds of things. I think, OK, let me think about the region that I know, Latin America. And I think, well, and let me think about the sector that I know, which is basically the social sectors. So what are the real problems in the social sectors in Latin America, right? We, um, Santiago Levy and I put out a paper recently in the Journal of Economic Perspectives where we sort of said, these are what we think are the main problems. One of them is school quality. That, we think, is probably the most important challenge in Latin America, at least in the social sectors. How, does, how do nudges help me? Where, what do they do for me? The other one is the financing of social security, which is all screwed up and sent it all. If I think more broadly, do I think if I take these, and I, I mean, I'm being provocative and somewhat unfair, but I mean, I figure that's the way to get a lively discussion started. But do I think if I thought this through more carefully, Argentina would have grown like Chile and eradicated poverty like Chile in the last 20 years? Or Chile like China? I mean, how much of a difference does this really make? You know, does it, is it really the answer? In some way, actually, we know in Latin America how to eradicate poverty. It's actually really easy. We've eradicated poverty amongst the elderly. It may not be a good idea. We've got these non-contributory pensions. They cost about 1% of GDP. There is no, po no more poverty amongst the elderly in Brazil. I can show you the graph. You just transfer cash to them. We're done. I'm not saying it's a good policy. No conditions, nothing. We can, a couple of points of GDP, we can redistribute income so there is no more poverty in Latin America. Those are, those are the real numbers. You know, there are no more people living below a poverty line of $2.5 2 per capita per day if we just redistribute. That's what they've done. That's how they, that's in large measure how poverty is being reduced in Latin America. Now, is this good policy? I'm not claiming it's good policy. There are all kinds of incentives and so on and so forth. But I just, I want to put things a little bit into perspective that many of the fundamental policy issues that we're struggling with are less amenable to this kind of analysis um, than perhaps, you know, listening to Sendel's very provocative presentation might lead us to believe. So those are my main, and I'm obviously happy to discuss this further. Let's say one thing about that. I, <laughs> <laughs> I figured. I, 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 I think we fundamentally disagree about policy. That is, I take an approach to these problems where this shit is really complicated. No, no, I really mean that. You say we know the three biggest things, I think we have no idea. I think we just don't know. And I, for me, I take a very fundamentally small approach to policy. It's small. I don't think anything I would say is going to promise a big solution that in 10 years we're going to eradicate poverty. We've had many of those promises. Maybe these will pay out, but they've never paid out. I think what we need is to take every problem very seriously and tackle every part of it. Do we need higher quality schools? Sure. Do we need to deal with social security? Sure. Do we need to deal with the fact that there's a lot of human behavior in every program? Sure. Do we need to realize that we're going to make mistakes in policy because we think schools are good, getting people <laughs> to schools is a good thing, then we find out the schools are shitty so it didn't teach anything? Sure. If I had a person dying or sick in my hospital room with a complex disease, I certainly wouldn't take the view that Oh, I'm going to figure out it's this disease, give them this injection. It, it's going to be complex. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to try stuff. It's not going to work. There's going to be problems. I just think that's the reality of policy. So that's why I didn't say in anything, I'm not promising silver bullets. I think there are people in the behavioral space who do promise silver bullets. I think that's entirely wrong. It's entirely unethical. But I think it's entirely wrong in every domain to be looking for silver bullets. I think we just need to realize there, every inch we can move forward, if we can put $100 in that earns a $200 rate of return, we ought to do that, even if it doesn't solve the big problem, even if it doesn't transform poverty. Because you know what? $100 earning a 200% rate of return is a good rate of return, as far as I'm concerned. So I do think that that is a fundamental world divide. And I think a lot of, if I think if people are looking for big solutions, I don't think this is it. Because I think that's going to be a patchwork of understanding where we understand a little better, move forward, and keep doing things that. On average, you're right, but keeping what you're saying in mind, there are going to be mistakes, and we shouldn't be, have hubris that we know what's right. So anyway, that's, but I think that's a, that is a difference of um, how I would tackle these things. Excellent. OK, Ariel, what do you think? So we've talked a little bit also about the idea of allowing ourselves to fail and then learn and adjust and things like that. Tell us a little bit about what, how USAID is taking some of these ideas into account. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's great to to be here at the new building. And uh, I see Alex Dier, who at USAID is spearheading uh, really the charge right now for us in the agency to look at poverty and the overall mission and mandate that we have to end extreme poverty. 
So I'm glad to be part of this conversation. It's fascinating. I really enjoyed both the presentations and you know, already this first part of the discussion. Uh, it, it is, uh, in a way, you're bringing two complex issues here uh, because all of the issues that have to do with behavioral economics and, and behavior uh, are, it's a whole world of its own. Poverty is a whole space of many, many more issues than, than just behavior. Uh, but it's interesting to bring it together because a part behavioral economics came out of high finance issues. I mean, a lot of people have been thinking there, or, or those who do advertising, they're pretty clever about all of these issues. And, uh, and yet, we're bringing that theory, those insights, to the fight against poverty. And I think that that's uh, interesting and, and useful because many of those issues were dealt with instinctively before or by trial and error. And certainly, this uh, science promised to help us guide this. I mean, at UCID, there's a big tradition. Half of our staff were Peace Corps. So they, hmm. you know, they go and hmm. live with the poor. And uh, although those experiments are never perfect, they, they learn a lot about what poverty is and the bandwidth issues and the choices that they made. I think it's important that uh, a, being, being in the field is important, understanding uh, both these issues, uh, but the rest of the issues, the structural issues and, and so on, are important for USAID to be effective. And uh, in we, for a long time, we talk about empowerment so that uh, a, we have to be careful because even that well-intentioned term could be draining whatever uh, bandwidth people might have and so on. In, we also learn from people themselves. And positive deviance is something we have used to look at how the poor themselves have figured out their solutions and whether other communities can learn from them. So there's a lot of that tradition that probably exploits at the margins the issues being discussed mm -hmm. here today. Uh, in, and more recently, of course, we have been even more aggressive on, on issues that are incentivizing behaviors. And, uh, but I think it does invite you to, to think whether we can do that better. Uh, it, I, the bandwidth point that you make is very important. And in our, uh, we have had recent conferences, you know, on uh, performance-based incentives. And I've always been fascinated by the concept of motivational crowd out. That if you pay some people to do something, and then you measure that outcome very well, you may not be realizing or measuring the things people stop doing so that they can get that money from that source. And, uh, and that's uh, something that the field should be struggling with. A uh, big experiment in England, people donate blood. You know, there are drives to donate blood, and, and you feel good donating blood, and, uh, and there's not enough blood, so the policy is let us pay people, and maybe we're gonna get more blood donations. So you start paying people, and donations went down, because you took away the motivation, which was non-cash, for people to donate blood. Once you take that away, majority who are doing it were no longer doing it. So it's always complicated what the policy will be and how it will play out despite great intentions. So we do have to mind those issues uh, uh, carefully. But I do believe it's, it is uh, complex uh, 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 for, for many ways. In, in health, we like to say that make the healthy choice the easier choice. And I guess your fault uh, 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 tolerant policy issue that Indeed, if you can enable those choices to be, that's always helpful. But as I said before, poverty and behavior in health is always far more complex than just the issues discussed. We need to keep them in mind because it can give us angles or not waste uh, efforts. Uh, but, you know, uh, in Cayalicha, in Cape Town, South Africa, guys on the side of the street, uh, he doesn't have a job, his life expectancy is short, there's a girl across the street. Do you think about a condom? Uh, so, so in um, behavioral economics, that does, uh, I believe, offers a promise that we need to exploit more mm -hmm. in our work, that uh, the way in which people look at risk and benefits is different. And understanding that, timing issues are also good. Uh, but again, being mindful that there are also structural issues. Nutrition, uh, a, we, I mean, Early malnutrition will really damage your capabilities forever in the school, in performance. So our policies go for the early nutrition. But we also know that even if you go beyond that, that, that some of our choices and our choice makings are primed by many other factors and beyond the structural ones that 
so constrain your choices, you are primed by virtue of being poor in different ways, uh, even, even at the genetic level or at the epigenetic level. Uh, if a mother is uh, malnourished during pregnancy, their offspring will be, the kids will be primed to, to actually seek food, absorb calories, retain calories. And so once food arrives in a society, those societies that were undernourished will then begin to become obese. And, uh, a, and then you will think that they're obese because they're poor and ignorant or they have no self-control, that we need to educate them or that we need to uh, a, incentivize them or charge them twice for airplane tickets or insurance or protect them from McDonald's. Uh, a, so the policies that come from logical uh, insights may not actually work at all that well because of that complexity. And so it's an invitation, I think, to, to be mindful of that complexity and then to bring these angles. Uh, USAID has also a, a historical tradition of working in behavioral communication change. And so there's a lot of experience and some success, but many barriers are still there for our BCC work. And again, I believe that some of the insights that uh, behavioral economics brings might help us do both our BCC work and our performance-based uh, incentive work uh, uh, better. But all of those fields are evolving. This field is evolving. Behavioral eco economics was nearly a curiosity just 20 years ago, and now it's, of course, an emergent. And I believe that there's potential mm -hmm. here to fine-tune the work that we do in a better way. Great. Thank you, Ariel. Can I ask a question about going back to, um, so if the goal is to eliminate extreme poverty, that's right, that's what President Obama said. And we've talked about how great cash transfers are. And if the problem is scarcity, should we just be transferring cash? I mean, is that a bad policy? Or what's your view on that? I'll ask Sendel. I think he should. Uh, I, I, think it's, I think it's a terrific policy. I think that it, it, in some sense, this suggests that cash transfers have this enormous added effect that we've never even measured. Mm -hmm. But I think that a lot of it goes back to the design of the transfer which is what one would kind of need to understand. Mm -hmm. I think that there's sort of a fundamental trade-off between a lump sum transfer and a sort of staged out transfer. Sometimes the staged out transfer, like take the farmer with the harvest, helps actually create the bandwidth you need over a period of time that you want to create it. Because there a big lump sum is being given. But sometimes the staged out transfer is foolish because it doesn't give you the big lump sum you need to make a big purchase. So understanding how do we know which one, understanding what are people's own knowledge of which one. How would a program work where you give people choice? I think most people presume that if you give people choice, they would take the lump sum. In fact, uh, in experiments we've done and others have done, people actually seem to be taking the staged ones, how, or at least some. And how good are those choices? Because after all, so here's another policy, something we're trying in an experiment with uh, Give Directly. Perhaps what you want to do is to give a small lump sum to kind of create the bandwidth for that week, and then give the choice for the big amount. Mm -hmm. Do you want to get the stage of the lump sum? Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a much better choice. Mm -hmm. So I think some of this is really about understanding. I love just giving cash, conditionally or unconditionally, but. I think understanding the nature of that transfer could make a big difference. And even when the transfer is given. So give directly, you're giving cash. But as you see in these studies, if that cash is coming at a certain time, it could have a very big difference, potentially have a very big different effect. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that's the complexity of the design issues. Design matters. So USAID will do cash transfers in the future, maybe. And that's Can you a, just sign on the dotted line right here? We have a, uh, okay. Okay. That's a good to. idea. And uh, the Germans, the Canadians, are ending poverty right on the spot. Uh, I'm an optimist, as you know, Amanda, and uh, I believe we are going to end preventable child maternal death in a generation and bring a grand convergence between poor and rich nations in uh, two decades. And this is not uh, just like the ending extreme poverty uh, a goal that we have now set for ourselves. It's not simply a good aspiration, a nice aspiration, it's actually quite feasible. It's actually happening. So I think when you look at the history of humanity, although, although the issues discussed are not just about money, sort of money is behind many of the problems that then create these issues being discussed. 
And income per capita in the world was flat for throughout the history of humanity. And it's only in the last 50 years mm -hmm. that income per capita truly has grown. Mm -hmm. And it has grown five, six fold mm -hmm. around the world. This is truly impressive. So we are at a time where uh, the idea that we can extreme poverty is indeed a feasible idea. And uh, half the countries that were in the low income bracket in 2000 are now in the middle income. And as you know, we, it's been a meltdown depending how you defini define poverty, extreme poverty recently. So I'm optimistic that we are in, in the right way. But I also believe that as we look at success, transitions for the poor, it's another stress. It's just fascinating to me to think that, that as I mentioned before, malnourished people, uh, malnourished in, in utero, malnourished in life, you're malnourished, you die, you don't get education. Uh, but now maybe there's food. But that becomes a new type of challenge for the poor. So as we mind my optimistic view that we will succeed in poverty, we need to mind that the transition out of poverty itself will bring challenges that those who are already out will not suffer. So I think the angles to look at poverty and the end of poverty are fascinating. And, and, and I believe that incentives need to be better organized. So I don't dislike your, your suggestion. I think it's one to consider. I'm going to come back to you to talk to us about why there are limits on the cash transfer idea yeah. in a moment, Norbert. And then we'll turn to Sendel. But first, let's let Salgado say sure. uh, his piece. Go ahead. Um, you know, I think the most interesting thing to me as we think about this is picking up on this, a couple of ideas there. One is thinking about how, what kinds of policies or what kinds of tools we think are useful for what kinds of problems. And I think what this work really says to us is we, we, we tend to obviously look for, say, interventions or policies that are going to, say, affect a particular kind of health as the thing to do when you want to affect this aspect of health. And I think very broadly what this work on scarcity is telling us is that there's a whole, there's a much broader way we ought to be thinking about this. We don't necessarily need to look for a health intervention if we want health to improve. There are broader interventions, or broader classes of things of which cash transfers, it seems, you know, sort of like one of the most obvious examples in some ways, to think about how to make other kinds of outcomes um, get better. And I, and I think Sendhil mentioned, you know, we've perhaps not even been looking at some of the things that something like a cash transfer does. We look at you know, how people spend it and certain things, but are we looking at all the other possible effects? Um, and I think the, the idea, and at Ideas 42, a lot of what we do is trying to actually take some of these ideas and actually see how they would operate in a real context. And I think when you start doing that, you start to see a lot of the power of this idea of something like timing, really thinking about timing, really thinking about staging. And um, I see one of my colleagues, uh, Sana from the World Bank here. So she's been working um, with us on a series of surveys for the World Development Report. And you know, we were piloting some of these things in Kenya. And what was really interesting was that this idea that you just mentioned about timing and there being points in the year when people are more stressed because perhaps predominantly of a lack of money, which is leading to other decisions that are being made, it comes out dramatically when you're doing these interviews because you you know when you ask people um, you know we're going to come back to you in January um, and do a bigger survey and the first thing that they say is well January is right after Christmas and in January we're going to give a completely different answer to anything you ask us because the only thing we're thinking about right then is we've spent all our money and we're really really constrained at that point and it starts to show up in things like, will your child be enrolled in school next year? And the answer is, well, they're enrolled right now, but I'm not sure about what's going to happen in January because I know that in January, in some sense, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to be constrained in this way. And so, it's, so, it, so when you think of it in this way, it's no longer just about whether should we give them cash or not. It's about figuring out what are these points in the year. Mm -hmm. we, we probably are going to give them some cash. How do we figure out when to do this and in what way that is actually going to be effective at easing that immediate constraint, but also really effective at sort of smoothing things out so that these broader um, constraints in decision making don't apply. And I think that's, to me, where the really um, the next step in taking these ideas forward lies. So Norbert, I have to ask you, because 
I know that the IDB has views on this at this point. What, what do you think about the limits to consumption smoothing using transfers as a tool versus yeah. other kinds of insurance mechanisms or right. planning? So the first thing I want to clarify is that I'm not speaking as the IDB. I'm speaking <laughs> as myself, <laughs> lest I get myself into some sort of uh, hot water. So I want to make that um, clear. And in some sense, again, I mean, I, I think uh, Sendel thinks that we disagree more than perhaps oh. we do. In some, in some ways, what I was trying to do is you know, get, get us to think about um, a variety of different things. So let me say a few things about cash transfers and also about how this relates to the stuff that Sentinel was bringing. I said two things, sort of two sweeping statements, both of which I believe in partly. One is, it is true that in Latin America, we've essentially eradicated old age poverty with um, uh, non-contributory pensions. I mean, it's, if you spend one, it's, it isn't, the math isn't all that complicated. I mean, if you look at the gap between the, the income of somebody who is elderly and the poverty line and work out how much it costs to bring them up to that and then transfer essentially that amount, it costs about 1% of GDP, and that's what countries have done. A number of countries have done that, and as a result, in many countries, you literally see poverty amongst the elderly is close to zero. So you can do it. Now, the question is, and I also didn't want to say, I didn't want to malign um, uh, the conditions that are attached to some of the, the cash transfers, because, I mean, what I mentioned in the case of Cambodia, that may just hold for Cambodia. I'm just saying we don't, things are, <laughs> to paraphrase Sendel, shit is complicated. <laughs> um, and so, yes, it's complicated, and, and there are no magic bullets, and we need to sort of work and figure out what works better and, and, um, and what does. Now, as regards to cash transfers, I want to say a couple of other things, because even even though I just said amongst the elderly we can do this, it's, um, there's a real challenge, I think, with the way in which you structure not only the timing of payments, which again, always, I always sit there and worry a little bit, say, okay, so, so at the end of that day, we are going to know better, you know, we are going to figure out what the right, we are, no, no, now we're not doing it in this silly economical way, now we're doing it this other way, we are going to figure out this is the right stream of payments, right? You know, why is it that this we're going to know better than the other things? I guess, I guess I'm, in, you know, on board with the kind of That's thing that Sendel says. Saying, right? We're saying well, let them choose. Right. Yeah. Okay. Let them choose, yes. But this other, this other stuff where, oh, well, if we, I agree with that. So I agree with that. In, in much the same way that I think cash transfers, especially the less tied they are, probably the better. Because it takes the onus away from us knowing, you know, the evidence from conditional cash transfers is there was a lot of fear that people were going to receive this cash and spend it on God knows what. They were going to spend it on cigarettes and alcohol. We find exactly the opposite. That may be partly because the transfers are going to women who generally do smarter things with their money than do men. We know that pretty well. Um, but in general, what we find is actually they spend a higher fraction, the households who receive the money spend a higher fraction on goods that we think are actually good things than, than other sources of income. So we see, for example, just to get a little techie about it, we see upward shifts in what's called the food angle curve. They spend a higher fraction of this money on food, is particularly on nutritious foods, than they do on, any, on, on anything else than they do with their regular sources of income, right? And we haven't conditioned it or anything. We haven't said, you have to go buy this. You, that's just what they do. They spend less of it on vice goods than they do with other sources of income. So all of this is quite encouraging. I think where, on cash transfers, you asked me about cash, and I do think there are, you know, we need to think hard about sort of the behavioral aspects of it. I'm not, I'm not, um, not saying no to that by any means. I do want to, since you asked me about cash transfers more broadly, I think one of the questions is a more traditional economic question, which, which is to, up to what point can you do this without disincentivizing the kinds of behaviors that, I mean, we do find now in more recent work, this is work that my colleague Mariano Bosque and I have done, that households who receive the cash transfers do reduce their labor supply somewhat. Mm -hmm. um, is that a problem? Maybe it isn't a problem. Maybe now they're spending time with their kids at home and it's largely the women who reduce their labor supply. It's largely women who are somewhat older than prime-aged women, but they do. Let's not kid ourselves. I mean, this is the fundament. This is why we did welfare reform in the US, right, in some sense, right? I mean, they get this steady stream of cash and well, they work somewhat less. We do find that. We also find a bit more behavioral, if you want, that they tend to work more. They switch from the formal sector, sort of the wage-paying sector, to the informal sector. Now that may be because they've been wanting to be informal all along, and now they've got the steady stream of cash and they start this wonderful little business idea that they'd never been able to do before. But what we know from Latin America is the productivity in the informal sector is abysmally low compared to the formal sector, and it may just be that they think that if they are sort of under the radar screen in the informal sector, that then they're less likely to be get bumped from the cash transfer, because these are targeted. 
So it's all, once again, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. It's complicated, and some of it is amenable to, I think, understanding it better with these behavioral tools, and some of it maybe less so. And at the end of the day, you know, I say, yes, we can eliminate poverty by having cash transfers, but you know, the real challenge for Latin America, in my view, is, you know, very low productivity, very low and falling productivity relative to other parts of the world. Does that get solved with behavioral, with these insights? Maybe some of them, but I mean, I, in some sense, what I'm saying is very useful, very useful for some things more than others. In some cases, unclear how that translates or how we think about this and how we design the policies that are likely to, I mean, in our best guess, make the biggest um, difference. So, Sandal, do you want to respond to the comments no, of the I think panel it's a great, and then we'll open to q &A. a great point about cash transfers as a, I had maybe misunderstood your question about cash transfers. I think your point about continuous cash transfers creating moral hazard, I, I mean, it's, Surely true. I mean, and, and it creates another, a large set of other distortions. I, th I think that what I was thinking about was for the ultra poor, the extreme poverty, there are these programs that try to give a one time infusion of cash into the system. Now, granted, what is one time? After all, there's moral hazard there too. And so, um, but I, I think that that, I might put that into a slightly different category. And the consistent transfer, I agree with you, there's an enormous complexity around moral hazard and a bunch of other issues. And having said that, I think we're also leaving another thing off the table. There's some it's an interesting work Antoinette Tour has done where I think we tend to aggrandize entrepreneurship. Your point about the informal sector, we tend to aggrandize like, mm -hmm. like, you know, my parents were entrepreneurs. They ran a video store. That is a shitty job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's terrible. You don't want to be an entrepreneur in that sense. You want to count every day at the end of the day, how much money you made to see whether it's low or high that determines how much you're going to eat the next day. This is the aggrandizement of entrepreneurship. Most micro entrepreneurs, you know what they want? Job. So another way one could approach this problem is to ask the question, what's a good substitute or are there other things we should be putting on the table for the extreme poverty, which is to ask the question, what would a job creation program look like for the extreme poor? In fact, you could even go further and say, well, since we're willing to give a cash transfer, would we be willing to create jobs that are net costly to us? Where, in the sense that the, product, the production value of what's being produced is less than the wage that's being paid. Maybe we would be. That's another form of a transfer. Mm -hmm. But now the transfer is being given in a fundamentally different way that's experienced differently and that feels very different. So it feels like we need to open up the space a little bit, mm -hmm. especially if on the table is continuous transfers, then we really need to open it up. But even for the lump sum, it feels like we need to open it up. Mm -hmm. okay. Great. Great. Well, I think this has been a really interesting discussion. So now let's turn it to the audience. You mentioned World Bank colleagues. I know that the World Bank is working on a world development report on behavioral economics. Um, so maybe they would like to ask a question or share an insight. But if not, I'll call on Mead Over, who is my colleague, which is not right to. Or, call or, the person you work with. But that's former World Bank, so he, he, <laughs> he, can, he can speak for the World Bank, apparently. Absolutely. <laughs> so this is a fascinating discussion. Thank you all for coming. Uh, it, it's really fun to have you here. Um, I've been promoting the use of uh, conditional cash transfers for and cash on delivery approaches to try to uh, encourage HIV prevention for a long time. And I get a lot of pushback exactly uh, because people will say, are you sure you're pushing in the right direction? What will you be pushing out? And uh, isn't this paternalistic? And one of the, uh, I, I think the, one of the most interesting possible responses that one might imagine to that, to those, uh, to that resistance is something that Sendel was suggesting, I think, a minute ago, and I wanted to ask you all about it. Uh, if, if you gave the poor an option between having an unconditional transfer of X dollars and having a portion of that be conditional on their sending their child to school. And you gave everyone that option, right? So some people, uh, uh, sort of the sort of naive economist's approach would be, well, of course they'd always take the cash. But from a behavioral economics perspective, maybe some of them wouldn't. Maybe some of them happen to know, for example, that their child would value the schooling, happen to know that their school is pretty good, and happen to know that they have trouble you know, managing their lives to get that child to school every day. So they would prefer the constraint. They would prefer the nudge. Um, and in a way, they would have uh, been, been granted the ability to have a nudge provided to them 
that some rich people have ordinarily in their lives and arrange for themselves. So I'm wondering, first of all, what you all think of that. And secondly, um, has anybody tried that sort of thing, asking the, the poor to design the nudges for themselves? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's collect two more questions. Do we have other comments or questions? Exactly Alex? That. I'll, that's why I'll, I'll mention it. You know. I don't have a very good paper, but <laughs> it could do that. Uh, Alex here from, from USA. Uh, this has been fascinating. Um, I wanted to push a little bit on the question of governance. Um, so uh, one of our grand hypotheses at USA is that in order for people to ultimately, for the path out of extreme poverty, become real and long-term sustainable, we also have to think about the governance of countries. And I'm curious what your research in behavioral economics says about people's ability and willingness to participate in governance decisions at the community or at the national level based on where they find themselves in the, in the poverty spectrum. We talk a lot about the importance of transparency and citizen engagement in our own programs at USAID, as well as in national budgeting decisions. But a lot of that depends on bandwidth and the ability of citizens to participate effectively in, in governance. And that changes in governance are incremental, and so citizen participation can ultimately bring greater accountability and greater possibility for participation. And so I'm mm -hmm. curious if, if, if the research of any of your folks here touches on that. Mm -hmm. OK, a final question in the front. So actually, I do work for the World Bank and for the World Development <laughs> Report, <laughs> but I speak for myself. Um, so um, I really appreciate your point about no silver bullets. I think that's something you know we repeat over and over again. We always heard it. And to, but to me, what um, really behavioral economics and scarcity really does is making a compelling argument for why we shouldn't look for a silver bullet, because we really see how we can have, you know, there are things we haven't thought about that are actually very important. And so uh, one of the fear that I have now with behavioral economics, that is actually, you know, people look for answers. Like, you know, you, you hear colleagues, coming like, oh, you're working on behavioral economics. I have this reform that failed. What can I do with behavioral <laughs> economics? And to me, that's a little bit uh, the danger that I see in just looking for other silver bullets. Where it speaks more to me as, you know, uh, for my work is like thinking how I can improve in the process of finding the solution, of opening the realm of things I look at and really being, you know, like um, just challenged to just think, you know, a little bit out of what I've been used to in trying to find uh, answers. I don't know. Excellent. It's more like Behavioral economics, a panacea. Okay, so we have three. So let's start with Sundal. Uh, yes, it is. No, no, no. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly your version. Yeah, I mean, what I say is usually a panacea. Yeah. Uh, no, I, let me go just in reverse order quickly. So I think that is such an important point, and I know maybe Shigata, you want to speak to this, but I feel like in the Ideas 42 model, one of the things that I take away that's most important is it's not finding solutions, but a big part of it is diagnosing the problem and allowing yourself to have a much wider range of diagnoses that you're considering as to the source of the problem. And that's just the nature. I think to me, I have, I actually am, pretty down on most of the approaches that call themselves a nudge approach, so not the original stuff. Because I think to me, they're just like throwing stuff at a wall. Let's just put in a default. Let's just put in a, it's very, in a way, I don't mean this in a mean way, it's a bit thoughtless. It's not actually recognizing uh, the fundamental complexity of the situation. And I think that one way I understand how the bandwidth stuff helped me think about all of this, and it's related to your point. Look, at the end of the day, people know more about their circumstances in many ways than we ever will. They know more about their preferences. At the same time, outsiders can know certain things as well that they don't know. And in addition, and this is the part that was very helpful for me, the thing I hate most in life, I just had a long day. And then I'm like, OK, we're going to do this thing. And my friend says, well, where are we going to go to dinner? I said, I don't want to figure this out. You tell me where we're going. I don't like choosing certain things. I genuinely don't. If I went to my accountant and said, well, here's 10 options, I'm like, why did I hire you? What the hell use for you? We actually pay people in our lives to take decisions out of us. So part of what I take away from bandwidth is there is the power of choice, which we cannot, but there's also the cost of choice. And that is something we just can't overlook. And so that's maybe to your point earlier. Let me just speak a little bit. You had JPE papers you should talk about. 
we actually have some evidence related to the productivity point as well, where we show that workers, these are data entry workers in a, low, in a, in a poor country, um, where when given the choice between two incentive schemes, an incentive scheme that paid per rate, this, this happened over a year, so they're given this choice like 100 times. And an incentive scheme that paid, if they didn't hit a target, they chose paid half, and if they hit the target, they paid the same amount. So no gain, only downside. A large percent of them chose the second kind. And actually, overall productivity, when offered this choice, went up by the, about the equivalent of about a year and a half of education. So huge productivity gains. Why? Because it's hard. You all know this. It's hard to work. And a little self-control device, even something as stupid as this, can help. Having said that, I don't know that the model I would take to scale is to give everyone the choice. There may be more reasonable models to make sure we're getting the right information out. For example, you mentioned, I know in my village it's good. But what if the choice was more at the level of, is this the policy that you think you would like for the village? Is this the policy you would like for this area? So I think there are more gradations between always saying, we're going to put these things in, choice, blah, 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 and kind of creating more information along the chain of like, we're actually learning and trying to understand what people want, et cetera. Um, and then just uh, quickly on your thing, I would love to see a study or a set of studies which just asks the question on a variety of civic engagement, how big of an effect is bandwidth? We can triangulate. It's clear from what we know about the psychology that processing information is very different when you're low on bandwidth. Willingness to engage is very different, but it is triangulation. Understanding on key issues we care about governance. Are people willing to report? Are people willing to make a complaint? Are people knowing how bandwidth affects those things would I think be just a super useful thing. Um, we can guess that it does, but knowing if it does would I think make a big pivot for me on how much I'd want to keep these things. Okay. Well, there, I think ten minutes. Okay. Did you want to? Excellent. No, right. I, I just have one. And then we'll... uh, one comment, which is in in response to Mead's um, question. There is actually an experiment that was done in Brazil. I don't know all that much about the details. The paper is published in the Journal of Political Economy, which in which they essentially gave parents the option of receiving an unconditional transfer or a conditional transfer. And I truly don't remember all the details, but a substantial fraction shows the conditional transfer. Not so much as I understand it because they wanted their own sort of hands tied in some way, but because they saw it as a way of monitoring the child. So some, what happened there was somehow like, Listen, dude, if you don't go to school, we don't have the, you know, 500 reais or something. You better get your ass to school, you know. And so that, I mean, that, that was something that the parents actually chose that. So I think, again, there's sort of, um, you know, there's, there's, there's stuff, complicated stuff to think about. Um, it's just, I mean, I, I completely agree with, with Sendil on, on two things about that. One is, yeah, it's, it's, it's very complicated to know under what, under what circumstances it's better to take away the choice or let people make the choice. And, and I also agree with you on this business of nudging. It becomes, you know, I'll give you one other example. The Brazilians, one of the, one of the concerns in Latin America is the fact that a very large fraction of the population is not enrolled in Social Security. And so therefore, unless they receive a non-contributory pension, don't have any savings for old age. So this is a big, and as it should be, it's a big concern. So what did they decide to do? Mainly, it's amongst the self-employed. So the Brazilians created this program in which they wanted to get the self-employed to register and pay regularly into Social Security. And the first thing they did is they reduced the price substantially. They reduced the price a lot. Nobody signed up. They reduced it to the point where they're subsidizing 90% of the net present value of the pension. And at that point, about one-third of the micro-entrepreneurs have signed up. So then they, the solution they found is, well, let's nudge them. So now let's send them, you know, text reminders, things like that. Let's, you know, information. Hey, dude, this is a really good deal. And come on, keep on paying. You sort of sit there and think, is this really the solution? I mean, is it, haven't we, it's sort of like you went down this rabbit hole. I mean, in some ways it seems pretty crazy, right? You're giving this benefit to these micro-entrepreneurs. Once again, sort of incentives loom large, right? Next thing you know, everybody's going to switch to be a micro-entrepreneur because you get the same thing that you would get if you were in the formal sector. But in the formal sector, you have to pay 100% for it. And now here you're paying... 10% for it, and even then, only about a third of the people are signing. It just seems so crazy. It just, as soon as you try to, you know, any of these things, as soon as you sort of try to unpackage it, it's so much more complicated than when you first take a look at it, including if you, if you use some of the, I think, some of the, some of the insights from behavioral economics. Certainly, if you just are very silly and just think people just behave completely rationally. I mean, these people are clearly not behaving rationally, right? I mean, it is the deal of a lifetime, no matter your discount rate, just about. 
you sh everybody should be signing up for this, and they're not. It's pretty crazy stuff. It's funny, that example is one that appears again and again, which I actually think happens because when people go to diagnose problems, they're not thinking broadly enough. The example is, you want people to do something, so you decide to incentivize. And you keep pushing and pushing on this one lever. And it's just like you see this theme again and again. You get it to these ridiculous points because you somehow feel like that's the thing that matters. And you almost misinterpret. You're like, well, if at this price point they're not doing it, they must really not want to do it. So we really, so it's often like I think the mistake people make, and it's exactly what you're saying, which is if you decide I'm not going to push on this lever, really what you have to do is pull it back. Say, okay, forget the 90%. Let's go back to 10%, 0% subsidy. And then let's ask, what if we had pushed on other levers from that point? But in fact, these things are almost plastered on. They're like, well, then let's plaster on SMS from, why plaster on SMS reminders onto a 90% subsidy? Let's pull the subsidy back. And then from a fiscal point of view, it actually changes the whole economics of it. Because imagine how much money you could spend on stupid SMS reminders. I'm not saying they will or won't work, but how much you could spend if instead of that 90% Subsidy, you moved it to zero and took that money and put it into there. That is a huge marketing campaign. You could match Levi's or Coke. But so there's that. That appears again and again in every contract. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ariel? Oh, thanks. Uh, I think especially that last example from Brazil, nothing hurts me more when I hear people who <laughs> do not match their 401ks because they're so poor that they just cannot even do that. And I think that's a huge opportunity for arbitrage, for the development and governments to find such issues and find clever ways because that's money on the table, left on the table by the poor. So I think a great opportunity. We, we, I would like to follow up also in, as, as you know, we do have a lot of experience with um, vouchers, conditional transfers, and we always doubt the successes. But when we are systematic on the experience and the literature, there are a lot of holes and failures, and it might be good to bring uh, this lens uh, as to see whether those well-intended efforts and other well-structured well mm -hmm. efforts could have been done differently and then be successful as opposed to just give up uh, a, on them. Uh, a, we have lots to learn. Uh, we are lucky to have at USAID Michael Kramer, who comes from the maker of the woods, and he's a, a behavioral economist who is involved with our development innovations uh, a, ventures, and which allow us to bring some of this creative thinking into that space. So, Yes, there are opportunities in USAID for this. And we also stole Mindy Hernandez from your shop mm -hmm. uh, for our work on social and behavioral sciences uh, so that we can bring some of this thinking. In the end, I believe personally that the insights that behavioral economics brings, I maybe side with you, that in the end had to come back to sort of rational economics and that the instruments eventually, once, once they benefit from the insights of those uh, abnormalities, can bring more uh, rational policy. Uh, in health, as you know, uh, we have been successful in the last 20 years, a lot of vertical programs, and, and then the notches for each of those. And more recently, the committee is looking at a big scheme of universal health coverage, which is forcing us to look at the space in a different way, which uh, particularly because it, it brings not only the issue of health and access to health, but also because the poor do not get that access, and those who are not so poor are going back into poverty. So I think that we should continue to think expansively in mm. how we address the needs of the poor, a benefit from the insights, whatever there's a big arbitrage opportunity, uh, in, and just as part of the uh, armamentarian, I would say, what we need to do to fight and to get to the end of extreme poverty. Excellent. Thank you, Ariel. Do you have any last thoughts before we turn it to Sandal for a last word? Only very briefly to just mm -hmm. underline, I think, the idea that actually coming out of what a lot of people are saying here, which is, um, it's, it's not about clearly the sort of mechanical application of any of these insights. You can't sort of throw it at the problem and expect it to go away, but it's really about figuring out what is actually going on in that particular context. Mm -hmm. And you know, to go back to the example of you know, the students who didn't learn when they got the cash transfer, that's really interesting because you know, you know, perhaps it, if the issue was that the quality of the schools was very poor, perhaps that's the one that you would want to address before you start incentivizing them to go or you know, working on that margin. And usually, in any problem, there are a number of different dimensions that are going on. So it's not to say that, so it's, I, th I think the takeaway is sort of not to say that the behavioral dimension is always going to be the only one or the most important one, but it's often an important one. 
And if you address it, then whatever else you're doing is likely to have much more impact as well. So I think that's mm -hmm. sort of bringing those two things together is um, mm -hmm. the most useful way to think about yeah, this. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Sandal? Mm -hmm. Oh, I just didn't have any. Let final me think about words. Uh, so my final, what's going to happen after this? If these are my <laughs> final that, words. Is there the something you know that I don't? <laughs> Weegee. <It's all> well. <laughs> well, my final words. Yes. <laughs> so long and thanks for all the this fish. Camp. No. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, I guess I would say that to encapsulate everything we're saying, I think there's a funding problem. I don't mean to say funding for more behavioral economics. I mean to say the structure of what we tend to fund. I think we tend to fund solutions. I think we tend to fund promises of solutions and evaluations of solutions. That's a pretty bad way to structure things because that means we're not funding diagnosis and figuring out what's going on. Now we fund research. Research is a bit more abstract. It's this type of stuff I presented. But actually taking concrete important problems, like the Brazil case, why aren't these people signing up? Now, diagnosis on its own is obviously a bit too abstract, like whatever. Is it? But I think funding time and energy and survey, whatever, as part of an analytical diagnostic process that gives you some guidance of what to try, and then maybe know what to look for when you try to see if you're doing it right, that's kind of the big missing part in this space. It's very hard. And in fact, it ends up, what ends up happening, like anything, when there's a funding shortfall, is there's a lot of stuff that purports to be experiments and evaluations, which is just diagnosis done on the cheap. Oh, we, didn't, we did two months of field work where we talked to people. Well, that's exciting. That's not diagnosis. It's not, I mean, it's just talking to people. It's just one person going and getting their impressions. So I think if we're serious about this stuff, I think we need to get serious about funding actual analytically driven diagnosis as part of a defined diagnose design and test process. Okay, and just to do an ad, uh, Sandal and Salgato wrote a great paper about this uh, design focus and bringing behavioral economics insights into the design of development policies and programs. So I encourage you all to take a look at that paper. And thank you very much to all of you, to Sandal especially, for such a great presentation, and, and to USAID for joining us uh, in organizing this panel. Thank you very much. Thank you.